Hello. My name is Annalie Carruthers, and I am the organizer of the Toy and Falola interviews. Welcome. In this series, Dr. Falola, globally renowned scholar and professor, will interview scholars and policymakers whose work and research are particularly relevant for the African continent and its peoples, including the diaspora. Dr. Falola will also discuss the scholars' most recent books with them. The ultimate goal in this series is to promote the work of great minds and to spread knowledge to the general public about current intellectual projects that these great minds are pursuing. Research themes can include, but are not limited to the following, African affairs, African migration, religion, culture, intellectual history, development issues, theories, women's rights, disability rights, post-colonial society in Africa and other parts of the global south, and globalization. These discussions will be recorded over Zoom, and these recordings will be distributed on the Toy and Falola Network Facebook page, Twitter, and website. Thank you very much for joining us, and we hope that you enjoy. having my questions today. Uh, I kind of just want to go off some of the things that you were talking about um, during the interview. And um, I guess the first thing is you were talking about how you take an optimistic view towards the development of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And you say like in some ways that's what other option do we have, right? States fail, uh, states fail and nations fail. So you really the only option you have is to be optimistic so i i'm going to kind of focus on that and i think the first question i have is where do you think it really started going wrong especially with nigeria because nigeria when it gained independence i think was a very bright so bright star so to, so to speak there was a lot of potential there people were very optimistic there but then it seems like there's been a steady decline throughout the year so where do you think what would you identify it going wrong first like I, I started with the, and uh, Professor Tony um, Palola started with the slave trade itself. The problem of Nigeria, if you take a long, durée view of history, precedes 1960. In 1960, we are we are just trying to wear a good dress and celebrate, but the, our problems of our leaders or so, um, the problems go um, further than that. And so this idea that. Um, at independence, Nigeria was good. That things are no. This ethnic infighting, the, the 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 corruption. There are now books coming out to see how corrupt. If you look at the leaders, either Awolowo, um, Azikiwe, and um, Bello, Amado Bello. If you look at all their history, and if they are not so free from corruption, there were allegations of uh, mismanagement. Um, some um, sometimes financial corruption or oppression of of minorities. There were polities where in the eastern Nigeria, if you didn't support the ruling party SCNC and they they uh, give you infrastructure after the election, they will come and dig those things out. And so there are those kinds of punitive uh, measures even in the in the north and, the, and in the western region. So they are there that. That was the best time with the production. Yes, we, we have it. But because we failed to address those problems that started before independence. And then six years after independence, we had the coup, which were telling us that things were things weren't good. And we've not, even after a civil war, we have not sat down to address our problem. Rather, we've allowed the debris to keep piling up. And to carry and on. We are so Fascinated. It's just like, 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 um, like the, the case of Nigeria is like a train, a car crash, right? People want to drive past, 
They cannot. They, they want to look and they don't want to look at the same time. So we are in that situation where every year or every decade, every set of rulers, we go into one car crash or the other. And that has caught our, our, our attention. But no matter what has happened in history, we can always wake up one day and say, this is where we're going. There's an, a saying in Igbo land. The Igbo say, a man day begins when he wakes up. We have been sleeping. So it doesn't matter what the history is, our day will begin when we wake up. It's not when, it's not what the time, the clock says, it's six o'clock or five o'clock. Your day begins when you wake up. And I think Nigeria has not woken up. And we need to do something to make that country to wake up to his, um, yeah, yeah, his potentiality. So, and thank you very much for that answer. G building off of that, so using the current state of the United States as an example, or just, I think, the current state of global politics, I feel like, um, in some ways, democracy is not living up to the promises or to its full potential. And I say that because there's a lot of populist movements, I, I believe, and mm -hmm. there's a lot of, yes, populist uh, uh, politicians and I think it preys on the fact or preys on the voting populace not being well educated in some ways or not being well informed maybe that's a better way of saying it and um, sorry I'm trying I'm building up to the point here which is um, Nigeria going into the independence or when when a lot of these foreign um, I guess foreign actors came into Nigeria they introduced a new system of government in some ways that was probably different from what a lot of African states had. So they had to adopt this new system, or as this is what I think at least, they had to adopt this new system and they adopted a system without fully adopting the principles of the system. So I, I feel like that could possibly play a part in why we see um, especially after independence, why we see Nigeria being the way it was. I, I once heard from someone that like, it's in a tribal community, it is normal. In fact, it is expected that if you go see a chief or you're going to see the king, you bring a gift with you, right? Because it is you paying homage to that king or that chief. If you do the same thing in a ministry that is seen as, um, that's seen as bribery or corruption, so there's a, there's a certain lack of ability to transfer ancient, or not ancient, but traditional African culture into the modern world. And is it possible that there's still, I, I'll, is it possible that there's still a clash? And how can we address that? Well, well let me say, oh, first of all, it's not in every African culture that you go and see a king. Mm. I, I take a gift to him. I don't think the jaws are like that. You have to be very careful in generalizing about African culture. The jaws yes. are very re, 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 Republican. The Bibos they have, in that sense, kings and um, and, and, and rulers. And, and and why we said that we need to see, um, we need to meet a king with a gift, right? But we forget that the king, before you bring that gift, had made your life possible, flourish, have given into, into you. And so, we, why do we forget that that aspect and, and 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 justify taking money from people when we we have refused to do our work? Like 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 for instance, I went to bury my mom, and the chiefs at home keep telling me what to pay. That is the new fee. I paid it. They will come back and they will change it. They come back and they, and, and they will change. It. And I have a friend of mine from, and and he said, "What are these chiefs bringing to you?" I said, "They're not bringing even a um, a farthing." They make me pay fees, feed them or sell for for uh, for for, uh, for for nothing. So it's you see, when people point to Africans giving something to their chief, they forget that it's a social payment system that the chief in the first place would have paid into your life. It's a form of insurance, and so so that's why we tend to forget that these things are are, are not different. The the the, the, the chiefs. Are paid into your life in the same way. In a modern democracy, we we pay taxes so that the 
the state will do infrastructure, right? And, and when he got to Africa, even in those days, when people come and give the money to a chief, he doesn't spend it on his shop. And that person will come in and ask the chief, I need help from that fund he will give. There is some form of accountability. So that is not equivalent to bribery. That is people, when they get to the ship, they contributing in the form of tribute or taxes or something to sustain. That is what, because when they go to the ship and give him two bottles of wine or whiskey, he, he's not going to drink everything. Some other person is going to come and he's going to give, right? But bribery in the modern bureaucracy, it stays in your pocket. And, you would, and, the, and the bureaucrat will not even do the work, will not benefit, and he will store or she will store that money in Swiss, in Swiss bank account. So, so the comparison does not um, does it really, hold? yeah, 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 it doesn't hold. But, but your question still has enormous merit in the sense that how do we create a system that will flow out of our inherited wisdom? our indigenous system. And then if we need to borrow one or two things from outside to bring it up to date, we can do that. But that is what is lacking. And that is why I said in, the, in my book on ethics and society, I tried all the principles I, I came out to understand Nigerian ethics or to, uh, I mean, ethics and society in Nigeria and to move the country forward. I excavated them from indigenous uh, knowledge. The same thing I'm doing for ec um, ec economic uh, theory now. So, is, so your question has enormous merit, but we have to be intellectually honest and sincere that is that really what we want to do? The current system benefits certain group of people, certain class, and they will let it uh, continue. And the, for many Nigerians, they're only quarreling with the system because they've not gotten there to have their share. The moment you put them there, they will do exactly the same thing themselves. And that's why I think that um, at this point, the debate, whether it's um, foreign or so, we need people who are revolutionary, people who are ready to change the system. And then if that commit commitment is there, we can debate those issues, how best to do it. Uh, otherwise, they will just throw those debates to us to confuse us and delay the whole process. We need a leadership. Where would that leadership come? Where would that revolutionary cadre come? I don't know, but one people writing, because sometimes the reason why we write, we are not writing doing our work for only those alive today. Others may come around the future generation and get the inspiration from some of the work we've done to push it forward and to find a way to implement them. That's why we do the work that we do. If you do, if you think you are only working for Nigeria today, you die of hopelessness. But you just hope that somebody is going to come out. Even if Nigeria does not exist, whatever is going to be come out from that group, from that territory, we still need some of the work that scholars are doing today to map their way forward. Thank you very much. And um, I think, I, I guess, so talking about restructuring, and I, I know you said that um, you might not know any, I, uh, maybe you didn't say this, but I guess the question I'm trying to ask is, what in this structure, what is most important to change in the structure? Or what are the most important things to change in the structure? What needs to be restructured? Because the whole system seems to be going wrong, but is it possible to, or not the whole system, um, the system seems to be failing, but is it the, as a result of the whole system or certain critical points in that system? Like you mentioned accountability in your previous um, in the previous discussion, right? Right. When we're just transitioning from traditional rule to, I guess, what we have now, in the modern era. What, even though you might kind of pay pay homage, I guess, in some cultures, there's also that system of accountability behind it, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it. it it seems like it's something that has not necessarily carried over and has not been enforced to the same extent in our current system. And I, I don't know, is there anything in particular that you think will need to be restructured or any, yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, uh, thank you uh, for that question. I listened to the debates about restructuring 
Now let us restructure the country so that the, the country can move forward. I'm not against that. If, 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 if a set of structure, if a set of uh, structure are not working for the purpose for which they are created, if they become an obstacle to human flourishing, then it need, they need to be amended. There's no question about that. But the, the call for restructuring is deceptive in one sense. Because any student of history or any student of ethics and society will tell you that in a matter of moving a state, a civilization forward, you need a minimum of two forms of restructuring. One is what they call statecraft, the governance system. How do you craft the governance system and change it? That is the governance system. You need to change that. So our argument is based on the statecraft, the governance structure, whatever it is. But there is the second part, and some people say that part is as important, if not more important, what in ethics we call the soul craft. What are the kind of human beings, the virtues, and the things that will come into play? Because we tend to be, as if the moment we create more states or restructure with this good power, things will automatically change. As Professor Fanola said, hey, they, they gave some money to the Niger Delta people and they put to run. What, what happened to it? And that story is repeatable or is repeated in every Nigerian region or state. So until we pay attention to the morality, to, to what they call the soul craft, and, and this is where people get sometimes too smart by heart. And they like to restructure. But but the, what I'm telling you is a knowledge that's about 2,400 years old. Aristotle wrote his book called Nicomachean Ethics. And Nicomachean Ethics is what kind of virtues that the society needs to have so it can prosper. And if you have this set of virtues, he said, what kind of capabilities you need to give to the uh, citizen, like education, clean water, um, good environment, religious freedom. So these virtues and the capabilities will create a better set of human beings that they will flourish. But then he went on to write another book called Politics, which talked about the constitution, the structure. And he said the two needs to go together. So this is something that any student of political philosophy or you know is that you cannot create a society if you just tinker with with the structures alone and forget about the virtues or the morality of what were the commitment of the yeah, of the people. And so in talking about restructuring in Nigeria, people are talking about one aspect. And we don't know whether we'll get that right. But everybody's silent about restructuring our soul. When I mean our soul, I'm not saying the soul that goes to, to heaven or hell. I'm talking about the, the morality, our ethos, our our numbers. How do we restructure that? And so without talking about that, you, are, you just have the feeling that is the ruling class maybe sometimes I give for restructuring to have to capture a base from which they will steal more. I'm not saying that everyone asking for restructuring is looking for a, 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 a captured site to steal more. But if we are sincere, we need to look at that. And the, and the political leaders today who are asking for restructuring should begin to restructure their own morality. And then we'll begin to see that they are sincere about restructuring the, the, the structures of governance. Right? So, so this, but in, everything in Nigeria, we, we, we tend to like just take one, uh, one side and run, and we don't pay attention. I, I would just think that people just have a feeling that everything is okay with us, with, 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 with our morality. Just give us more power and, and, and things will be okay. But it's a law. Because that's why some of us don't just start from economics. Is this kind of thought that moved me from my uh, area of specialization for economics and finance to this issue of philosophy and ethics? Because I said we cannot be talking about economy or technical issues of economy until we pay attention to these issues of virtues, philosophy, worldview. And that is what you can create a system in the West. It takes one man to come on this that doesn't believe, is not committed, doesn't have the virtues, 
to destroy the institutions. And we see it happen over and over again. That's why every civilization has a way of educating its youth into these virtues and the values and the morality that they think will sustain that civilization. In Nigeria, we are always fighting about structures and everybody took his hand. And as Peter Eker said with the two morality, you see that split that occurs in the colonial time. And he, he even went for another work, you see, during the slave trade has followed us and it appears morality has almost evaporated from our public square. And not only the public square, Pideke was concerned about the public square. It has evaporated in the what, what he called the primordial, um, the ethnic square. It has not even evaporated from our own families because parents are doing things, paying, bribing invigilators, for example, buying papers and celebrating. So, so this prob problem grows deep. But as long as we are people and we have a problem, if we put our heads together, that is always the hope that we may find a way. I believe that Nigeria is not in ruins. Because to offer that argument that morality and everything is in ruins means that I or anybody does not even have a place to stand. But the fact that I could find a place in our history to stand means that there is a site, which historical site that I'm calling people to say we can do this means that everything is not yet in ruins. There's a place we can call people back. But the question is, do you have the critical number? Are we willing why it to come that somebody, a friend of mine told me that even if you bring Jesus Christ to Nigeria, that uh, they will try to bribe him. And if, if, if one is not careful, hey, you may have a different story. To tell you how bad the, 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 the system is, let me uh, tell you one thing. About 10, um, 10, 15 years ago, there was a, 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 um, a research group, a, um, a UN sponsored uh, reconciliation, conflict and, uh, yeah, and reconciliation uh, meeting. And they invited me to come and give a paper. We were talking about conflicts. How do you bring people together? And everyone was talk talking about forgiveness or so. And I went to that conference when it came to my speech, and I said, I beg to differ that in Nigeria, perhaps we've taken forgiveness uh, too far. And I said, the problem of Nigeria is this I beg you culture. No, I can't. Anybody can do anything, and then we send our orbs, our emirs, our chiefs, our obese uh, to, to go and beg. Somebody will never hold people accountable. Why? Right? So, and I said, it's so bad in Nigeria that um, on the road, you find a taxi driver, you try to warn him not to hit your car. He will hit your car. And the moment he hits your car, he comes back and he double-edged. And then the, the, the people will begin to uh, beg you. Say, let him go. I said, there's no, you have to bear the cost. And when he said no, they say, ah, he has even taken your, he, he has begged you with your, with your mother. He don't beg you with your, with your mother. You be God, even God said, will, uh, Will give it. okay. I beg you in the name of God. So, once they beg you for anything, then there's no accountability, there's no penalty, and the same problem will of course. So I told them in Nigeria that if you allow Nigerians to go to heaven or hell in the day of judgment, they can beg God. They will say, God, I tell God, beg you. Ah, ah, with the, with the, I tell God, beg you. And so, so there is a culture that we have that no one wants to be held responsible. Or anything, I will not repair that bad road. And then next day, a child will die from that road, and they will go back and uh, yeah, 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 and beg again, right? So until we find a way to restructure morality, to restructure the 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 virtue system, we are not ready to build a country. Civilization often is not carried by its technical prowess, armament, and material things. There is always this intangible, this morality, that no civilization in history has prospered without this kind of ethical, moral, ethos, 
some kind of thing that's, that's torture. And one thing that we quoted, uh, Mas Beba was trying to, what was trying to show in the book, um, um, Protestant Ethics and the School of Capitalism. He was trying to remind people that the basis of capitalism, the progress we've seen in the uh, northern part of Europe is based on some kind of deeply held morality that have gone into the being of people. What he was showing in that his book is to say, the manager the, the, did not need to tell you to come to work, to work hard. You have imbibed the need and the value to work hard at your work because you are doing it for the glory of God. That, he said, was the engine. And people just forget that. And people may criticize it for his capitalist support. He's saying capitalism has formatted them. But from a civilization, a progress theory point of view, is hitting at something that is important, that this intangible, this value system, are very important for building and sustaining civilization. What is the capitalist civilization? If a, 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 a feudalist civilization or a Nigerian civilization or a Nigerian post colonial civilization, we need a value system and we cannot say that is important. Yes, thank you very much, Professor. Like, so what I'm getting from this is you know, we'll be talking about restructuring, especially on the national level, mm -hmm. but we forget we thought first we might need to restructure our morality and our values, mm -hmm. we need to first. We need to first hold ourselves accountable and we need to make sure that we are whatever we make sure that we are the foundation for whatever system we're going to build and yes. we have to be that solid moral foundation yeah so um also i i just uh, while you were talking about this um a few things came up the first one is um i i very much admire like your commitment and professor falola's um sort of commitment to i guess the grand endeavor of education because uh, I believe that education is one of the ways, mm -hmm. probably the prime way that we are able to impact this value system. There, there are many other things that impact it, but education is very key to that, in, I think, in my view. So um, I guess I'm, I'm not sure where to, where to go from here, but how it, it, the next part that came to me, the next point that came to me was that it's almost a bit of a paradox in some ways, or a, a not chicken and the egg problem, but people tend to lose their values as a result of their leaders, and their leaders take their place or are able to get to the position sometimes because of the values of mm -hmm. the people. People will um, people will condone and endorse leaders based on what uh, should at least condone and endorse leaders based on their values and the val and but those same leaders are the ones who influence the system and the people underneath and i'm guessing only certain revolutionary or certain um i guess certain critical events can break that chain or break that or to disrupt that system uh do you have any views on that well um is 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 it's a common saying that leaders reflect their own people. But the point about Nigeria is that the leaders were never voted in. Let us not forget they rigged themselves in. So we don't even know whether they are like the people or, or, or not. Because you say, oh, they voted. It. Almost every election is rigged and, and stuff. So we don't really know what the um, people really want or, 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 yeah, yeah, or so. And we, of course, we see cases of people taking selling their uh, PVC, their voters' their card. To, to do. But the, the whole idea of Nigeria that yeah. somehow the leaders reflect the people is, is, is a stretch because none of them can say they won the election clean and, and fair. Let them allow a free election. Yes. And, and then less, less, less people um, uh, choose. But once a system has broken down, like in Nigeria, it doesn't really matter whether the people are so. Everybody knows that broken down. The question is, how do we rebuild it? Because it becomes um, a chicken and a egg, egg case, right? Oh, the people are. We know that the leaders have failed. We also know that the masses, with the masses, have failed. And anything in between. 
So the question is, and no one will tell you in Nigeria, both the leaders and the masses that there is, there is no need for restructuring of morality. We all know that. But where is the way? You know, we, 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 we seem to have been paralyzed about what to do. And that's where I'm hoping for this, in, in, where the new set of leaders will come from. I don't know, is 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 the is the case of the new, like um, the chaotic moment. Where would the new come from? We don't know. But we hope that it, it will come. But as far as we are being paralyzed, it's an old problem. In um, Plato, in the Greek, they call it akrasia, a k a r u a s i a, akrasia. Akrasia means when somebody that you are not drunk and you are not mad or something is, 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 is not wrong with your thinking faculty yet you know the good and you, you, you can't do it it's a puzzle <laughs> that the greek couldn't solve they call it a crazy how could somebody you're not crazy you're not a child there's nothing wrong with you you know the good you can because their point was the good should be attracting you by reason the good you should move towards the good but the yes. that case is where the person is, is, is a, a sound mind and the person knows between the good and the evil, knows the good, but yet cannot do the good. It's, the it's a deep ethical problem that from Plato's time is being debated. What causes acrasia? And Nigeria seems to be um, a country afflicted with high doses of acrasia and amnesia. Plus that we lose memory of what, what has happened. At the same time, we don't know. Our leaders stay in place. They know what to do. But yet, you can't do it. And so, what do you do if you know that human beings occasionally will fail? That's why you create structures to check, to do check and balances, right? You, you, you create these structures to, to do check and balances so that when they fail, the assist or somebody will be there to catch them or prevent a disaster from, uh, from happening. And that is where we are. Nigeria. A, a problem is deep, but I, I don't think it's unsolvable. We we can solve, and I don't think we, we need to combat hundred percent of the country. If a, a small five to ten percent will be committed to doing that work, I don't think uh, any any civilization in history has been built wholeheartedly, completely by every man or woman in that society. We need to find that core. That would rise. I feel that Nigerians, Nigerians have a lot of potential waiting to be unleashed. We need to find that, and it's not going to be an easy. It's not something we start today. We started, they may defeat you, but we we we, 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 we keep going on. My only surprise that I didn't know when I was in college that I left university in 1984. We are now in uh, 2000, uh, 2020. That we we'll still be in this problem. It's, 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 it's completely, I thought by now the problem should have been solved. But, you know, um, I've not given up um, on the country. We keep trying our best until one day the Lord uh, calls us or, or it's over and we, and we hand over the baton to the next um, uh, generation. They want all of us to accept defeat and turn their back so they can do, but at least some of us, even if we, we, we cannot do anything to them, the fact that we tell them our eyes are open and watching and recording what they are doing for history. That alone, we are bearing witness to history. That alone, if that's what some of us can do, let us do it. Let us bear witness. Because if you bear witness to a story, that story will be told someday. So from history, <laughs> and just from some of the stories that you told, how does one go about killing a god? Because it's a it's a tremendous task. I remember in 2000, I was teaching a class in NYU, and I talked about Africans kill their god. And there was a, a student from India. She said, it's impossible. You can't kill god. I said, well, they just go find a way to kill uh, kill their gods. And, and so when they say they kill their gods, it's, it's something rooted in African worldview. And this is how. This is a way to, to in Africa, whether you kill a god or a sheep, every relationship is every position, every status 
is based on relationality and relations. Once you have people withdraw their relationship, you are dead. And that's what clean of God means, right? A God is powerful as long as there are people worshiping him or it or her, a God. And as long as people pay obedience to it, and there are people that believe in it or so, once they turn their back on that God, that God loses his power because his power is based on relation, relations with people. Yeah. So in the same way, a king is a king because they are subjects. But if the subjects were to withdraw completely, there is no king on his own. There is no king on our own. Once everybody says, you are no more a king, we withdraw for some reason. The power is God. So it goes back to this issue of relationality in African worldview. That ultimately everything depends on relation. And if you fracture that relationship enough, it could it could go away to the point where there is nothing to stand up. I think that is the principle they are demonstrating. That a God will not have power over you to invoke uh, his name or her name or punish you if we the people do not believe. Take for instance now, if you grew up 2,000 years ago in Rome or Greek, you, you'll be afraid of Zeus and Jupiter. The same way people in Western and some people are afraid of Ogun and, 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 and other gods, or, or, or in the Hebrew land, Amado. You, you, you can go there afraid. Ask yourself, are people in the West still afraid of Jupiter and uh, Zeus? Because relationship is broken. People don't pay that much attention to it, and the gods are wicked. Yeah. Right? So this is an important lesson from this. So they kill a God by cutting off the commitment and relationship to that God. They and that God needs... So that's what we're saying. We, we carved you. means that our relationship built you up. In the same way, all these positions are powerful because we, the people, have put all our crowns under them. We, we bow before them. But if we stand up and say, you are no more our president. You are no more our governor. Collectively, that very day, that politician loses his uh, status. And that politician is no more a big man, a big woman, is no more a god. And that's why they're saying that you cut off that relationship. What gives that God power is human beings worshiping and obeying and doing the sacrifice and be fearful. The moment all that evaporates, that set of relationality is gone, that God is derobed. And that God has no power. And so that is the principle I'm bringing together. If people could think that way about a God, why can't we think that way about the thin gods that call themselves politicians? So that is where you kill a God. You cut off what sustained that God. You, you cut it off. And that is where you kill a God. A human yeah. beings have been killing gods all through history. It's, 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 but we don't seem to notice it because we, we don't have, often we don't have a record of it like this one about the the Calabar is native to the same actual record of the universe. But if Islam moves to move, move, move into a territory, all the other gods are almost automatically dead. In most cases, they are no more worship. Some of them may, 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 may survive, but, but they become powerless. Once you believe in Allah, or once you believe in Jesus Christ, the other gods be, 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 be become powerless. So it doesn't mean they are dead because often dead, there is no more relationship, there is no more offering, there is no more priest or so. That gods evaporate. If you go through history, Gods, gods have come and gone, just like, uh, and so that's what these people were demonstrating. They are not waiting for a new religion to come in and overthrow their gods or kill their gods. They, on their own, decide to kill their gods. So we don't need to wait for some marine force or UN force to come and force these uh, politicians out of office. We need to rise and say, you are no more a god. Relationship, you don't have a governance, a governor, governor's relationship, ruler and rule relationship is gone. You are nobody. And on that day, they will lose their power. And that's and that is the way you kill a god in the same way you can kill a politician. Once again, let me thank you so much for granting this. And um we have um two generational sets of interviews. In the section with them was more structured. But this one I like a lot. Thank you so much. Okay, we, thank would, you. Um, we will spend a lot of time on the post edit and cut out. And we are very grateful. 
Yes, I'm going to have your dinner now. Thank you.